mean, I wanted to marry Harry. You wanted to marry Harry. You wanted to marry... We all wanted to marry Harry. We've already seen the incredible twists and turns of Meghan's life that led her to Prince Harry. She's devoted her time to good causes. I don't think it's right for kids to grow up thinking these things. Risen to stardom. When she landed the role in Suits, Meghan became a legitimate bona fide celebrity. And mix with the London set. She was sitting in the royal pretty much. She's like an arm's throw away from Pippa Middleton. We've charted the incredible journey that took her from the streets of L.A. I'm a California girl, born and raised. All the way to the doors of Kensington Palace. It really has just been a fairy tale, hasn't it? She's won the heart of her prince. Harry, when did you know she was the one? Very first time we met. And got that ring on her finger. It was a true marriage of Hollywood royalty with British royalty. But it's still long walk to the altar and until she sails down that aisle nothing is guaranteed she verged on the political the royals don't do that all sorts of problems were coming megan's way from disapproving family members you are interested in helping those less fortunate than yourself it really should begin at home to fall out over the invite list have you got an invite to the royal wedding have i yeah not that i know so how did megan take on her critics and ensure the path of love ran smoothly. She does what any of us would do. Hashtag ignore, ignore, ignore. If you fancy bagging a prince, tonight, our step-by-step -step guide continues as we open the next chapter in the story of Meghan and her prince. Meghan and Harry were united in their passion for change. And in the months following their engagement, Meghan had thrown herself into charity, winning the hearts of the British public. It was clear from day one that she was like a duck to water. She is absolutely natural at this. Very engaging, very warm, lots of eye contact. Harry was showing off his new fiance far and wide, and she charmed everyone from all walks of life, including those who walked on four legs. She even wore a matching coat for the occasion. You can see the American effect of Meghan Markle in every single photo call and every single walkabout. When Meghan goes on walkies with Harry, she's hugging people. In Nottingham, the couple visited charities that were close to Harry's mother's heart. You can see the pride in Prince Harry. I mean, it was a joy to watch. While back in London, a visit... Everyone is listening, and I'm in the same room as the royal couple right now. They actually my hand I didn't expect that I thought you know it would just be a distance um, they were pretty cool it was a real nice good feel-good factor they should come more often they really should slowly but surely the British public was falling in love with our Meg but would this be the case with the in-laws the next step in Meghan's journey would be getting to know the firm and the hotly debated topic of her background was never from the fall. You be you be Harry, and I'm gonna be the um, you know Queen <laughs> Queen Elizabeth since I got this on right. And you telling me about your your girlfriend? Okay. Uh, hello, uh, uh, <laughs> grandmother. Um, I met this beautiful woman. And <laughs> she just happens to be mixed race. <laughs> Step six in our guide to bagging a prince is charming the in-laws. One of the things I found really amazing when I was charting this story was just how warmly welcomed Meghan had been into the royal fold right from the early stages. The early meetings with William and Kate and Charles and Camilla, they were very welcoming. And actually, the speed at which Meghan was introduced to the Queen was very surprising. When I looked back at Harry's relationship with Chelsea, it was several years before Chelsea was introduced. Queen Cressida, who dated Harry for two years, was never introduced to the Queen. But with a matter of mere months of dating her, Harry had Meghan meet the Queen. She's an incredible woman. And the, and the Corgis took to you straight away. <laughs> In fact, Queenie was so impressed that mere weeks after the couple's engagement, she took the unprecedented move of inviting Meghan to spend Christmas in Norfolk at Sandringham, giving Meg the opportunity for a serious charm offensive. It was a tremendous 
think with convention, that the Queen invited Meghan, who was, after all, just a fiancé, to Sandringham, because normally it's just the wives and the husbands of members of the royal family who are allowed there. I was told that the Queen's feeling was this. She's preparing to give everything up for her grandson, her career, her identity, her nationality, her home in Toronto, everything to be with Harry. And the Queen's feeling was the very least we can do is to make her welcome at Christmas. It does show that the Queen is walking in step with the change of the guard at Buckingham Palace. This would have been a far different Christmas to the one Meghan spent in L.A. the previous year, with the historic 20,000-acre estate playing host to all sorts of... ...perhaps who get ahead around quite a few uh, royal family traditions. They open their presents on Christmas Eve. The presents that they exchange aren't what you'd really expect for members of the royal family. They tend to share really jokey presents with one another. In America, you know, things will come beautifully wrapped and be quite extravagant. And this is the other end of the sphere. You're admired if you find somebody's given you an unusual spoon to stir cakes in or an unusual thing to keep your corgis in. Meghan would have to embrace all these funny little customs, and clearly she did. <laughs> After spending the night in her unfamiliar surroundings, the bride in training faced her public in that most royal of festive traditions. The post-service walkabout at St. Mary Magdalene Church. Well, the Sandringham Church photo is the timeline through history. You have a snapshot every year of those people closest to the throne. Now, often you're looking at a picture of a child who was barely able to walk perhaps a year ago, and suddenly they come out of the church. That image will change. In a few years' time, will have those couples and their children will be going to church in a few more years' time, and you may not have the older generation. This year, of course, was Meghan's year. The presence of the royal fiancé drew crowds that were even bigger than usual. The world's media was also out in force, but it was a member of the public who would snap the photo that cemented just how much Meghan was in with the younger royal crowd. Unfortunately for all the photographers on the they just didn't quite seem to get a clear shot and in the end it came down to a member of the public a lady called Karen Anvil it was like a Mexican wave of cheers so you knew they were coming the photographers at the other end and they just happened to look over and I took one photo that's the thing I took one photo and it was yeah the right one when we that shot, it was an absolute no-brainer that it was going to be our cover shot because it was the only one that had captured that moment, the four of them together. And, you know, it symbolised quite a lot in terms of the royal family and where they're going in future. So, um, yeah, I mean, we were delighted to use it on the cover. And just like that, the Fab Four were born. Clearly, Meghan was well and truly fitting into the royal club. Just like the Queen, it seems the rest of the family were equally charmed by Harry's bow from across Another tick for Meghan. William was longing to meet her, and so was Catherine. And Catherine's been absolutely um, been wonderful. amazing, as is William as well. He, you know, fantastic support. And then my, my father's already had, had a handful of teas and meetings. He found herself a true fan in the Duke of Edinburgh, and he was apparently hugely impressed with how well read Meghan was. Meghan was now in with the in laws. But coming up, events were to turn. Increasingly tricky. Dealing with critics from near. I think she's trouble because of her background. I thought that she could, not would, but that she could uh, be trouble. And far. I think the very fact that Samantha wanted to do a book called The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister implies that maybe she was not over fond of her younger half sister. Meghan was proving popular with the in-laws, the friends, and was now conquering the British public. But what to do when you find out not everyone likes you? I don't know about his Meghan Markle. Yeah, she's too confident and self-assured. Do you see what I mean? It's water feature um, shit, isn't it? Give. Oh, my God. I thought I was doing so well.
When the news of Prince Harry was dating an American actress first came out, I think that the reaction amongst the British public especially was equal parts excited and disproving because she's not British. From the very moment Harry and Meghan's relationship had broken in 2016, much of the press inevitably had gone raking through Meghan's past. They made it sound as though she had grown up in like the slums of LA, like riddled with like gangsters and drugs. With some reports focusing on the breakup of her parents' marriage and her relationship with her half-siblings. Time is seven minutes. Harry past didn't help matters when he went on to guest edit, edit BBC Radio 4's Today program. It started well. And Morning. Very good to see you. He got some of his mates on the show, like this guy. Okay. But I need the British accent. But if you start if you start using long pauses between um, the answers, you're probably gonna get right. it's the, 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 the face. Are you, <laughs> let me see the face. <laughs> oh, okay. But during the course of the programme, Harry answered one question about Meghan. It was your future wife's first Christmas with the in-laws. Mm -hmm. How was it? Uh, she, she really enjoyed it. The family um, loved having her there. And, it's, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the family that she, I suppose she's never had. It's the family that she, I suppose she's never had, never, never had. But Harry's comments did not go down well with one member of his future wife's family. Meghan's half-sister, Samantha, was very cross with what Harry said on the Today programme about the family not being close or a normal family. Samantha tweeted that that was really not the case, and she defended their family as, as a normal family, a close family, a loving family, and didn't understand what Harry was talking about. A book called Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister. I think the very fact that Samantha wanted to do a book called The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister implies that maybe she was not over-fond of her younger half-sister and maybe is a little conflicted about Meghan's success. There's no bigger media vulture with this wedding than you, is okay. there, Miss Markle? I mean, how you have the gall to come on here and talk about media vultures? You've just, you're doing a so book that... called The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister. You'd be trashing it for two okay. years, you little vulture. I've made it clear in several interviews that you can't judge a book by its cover, and similarly, you can't judge a book by its title. Samantha also criticised Meghan's charity work. If you are interested in helping those less fortunate than yourself, it really should begin at home this bad publicity derail the wedding? And just how should Meghan respond to this particularly barbed attack? The temptation must have been huge for Meghan to have responded to the critics, who were, of course, her family members. She kept a dignified silence. I mean, you've got to feel for Meghan. What would you do if your family were being an absolute nightmare? It is seriously embarrassing. So she does what any of us would do. Hashtag ignore, ignore. Ignore. But would Meghan be able to keep her composure in the face of her next critic? A certain ex-Tory MP, a die-hard royalist, who voiced her doubts about Meghan, not in private, but in the most public setting possible, the celebrity Big Brother house. OK, let's take yeah. a vote. I think she's trouble. Uh, how long? Do you think she's going to be five Why years, ten trouble? years, twenty years? Why do you think she's trouble, Anne? Background, um... Attitude, I, I, I worry. She's older than him. Yeah. She's been married before. Yes. I add it all up and I'm uneasy. But there we go. Quite frankly, I was shocked when Anne Widdicombe said that what she said. I mean, I've always thought that she was a sensible woman. She seems to be jumping to conclusions without looking at any evidence. The ex-minister's comments sent the Twitter sphere into meltdown. When I was on Big Brother, I was called every and every ist going. I was homophobic, xenophobic, uh, racist, sexist, misogynist. Nothing I said could have been remotely construed as racist by any sensible observer. I mean, all I said was I thought that because of her background and I was thinking of freewheeling Hollywood background, you know, former marriage, all the rest of it, uh, that because of her background, I thought that she could, not would, but that she could uh, be trouble. She had, I think, the older generation view of this is an outsider, a foreigner, coming into a very British world. The thing that all of us have to do is adapt. We're in the here and now. Embrace. But one woman who was not prepared to embrace was Jo Marnie, girlfriend of then UKIP leader Henry Bolton, who sent a series of racist texts. Even then, Meghan kept quiet. The royal's mantra is often put up, shut up. You 
can't be seen to always answer back. Uh, you do have to put up at points. So actually her approach, maintaining that dignified silence, not justifying or even giving any credence to these claims, some of which were really quite unpleasant. Well, it was a very royal approach to things. Look, Meghan is showing the makings of a true princess. You've got to have that decorum. You've got to, on some occasions, actually, you know, keep silence and pick your battles. Even more flack came Meghan's way when she took to the stage with her potential prince, his brother and Kate, at the Royal Foundation in February 2018. People say, well, you're helping women find their voices. And I fundamentally disagree with that because Women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice, they need to feel empowered to use it, and people need to be encouraged to listen. And I think there is no better time than to really continue to shine a light on women feeling empowered and people really helping to support them. She verged on the political uh, when she was talking about women's empowerment, and it was all a bit Me Too-ish. The royals don't do that. And indeed, the day that the royals start engaging in political causes is the day you get a lot of controversy. There is a very good reason why the royals stay off politics, and it's to avoid precisely that. Not everyone shared Anne's view. It's refreshing, because she isn't saying things that are incredibly controversial that we actually wouldn't stand by or back or, or believe in. These are really important points, important issues that she's raising, especially when she's touching on feminism. But was Meghan risking her relationship with the royals and the public? She's clever. She's using her voice in, in a good way. And she has actually been backed by the palace. But still the criticism came and the palace had to release a statement defending her. Was this one step too far? This is the first time that we've heard anyone associated with the royal family talking about those campaigns. The Kensington Palace stressed that it would have been impossible for Meghan to talk about issues surrounding female empowerment without talking about those campaigns. Well, I think that by touching on the Me Too campaign, Meghan probably knew that there was going to be some kickback, and indeed there was. But actually, she got far more people saying, this is great, this is what the royal family needs to be doing more of. Phew. Looked like Meghan had found just the right balance to please the palace. So, next step in our guide, embrace your prince's religion. She signed up to the Church of England, of which the Queen is supreme governor. And exactly 100 days after her engagement announcement, Meghan was baptised in the chapel of St James's Palace by the Archbishop of Canterbury. It was very special. It was beautiful, um, sincere, and uh, very moving. It was a great privilege. Although she had attended a Catholic school in LA, Meg had a Protestant background. Her father was a member of the Episcopal Church of the United States. It would not have been an enormous step, you know, to get baptised, but it was a big step in a way. But I think out of deference to the Queen and to her very strong faith, it sort of tidied things up and it all goes well for the future because she will have to attend many, you know, services in Church of England cathedrals. Coming up, Meghan's headed ever nearer to that chapel of love. But the journey would become increasingly problematic. With a guest list to organise... Have you got an invite to the royal wedding? Have I? Yeah. Not that I know. And dramas coming thick and fast from her very own family. All of a sudden, his health isn't good. And he can't come to the wedding. Da da da! Welcome back, where we find Meghan almost at the final furlong of her romantic journey. But managing your wedding carefully was not to prove so easy for our Meg. First hurdle, the date. The wedding of Prince Harry to Meghan Markle. The date, the 19th of May, 2018. Recent royal weddings had all been held on weekdays, but not this one. I think that they thought, we want people to enjoy this, so why not? it on a Saturday and if you think about most weddings that you and I go to they're at the weekend so why wouldn't you follow suit but there was one reason to avoid that Saturday it had already been announced as the date of the FA Cup final as president of the Football Association Harry's brother Prince William was expected to take his usual place in the royal box at Wembley and millions more were looking forward to watching the game on TV I think my wife would probably want to see the um 
a wedding. So what I'll probably do, I'll probably leave her on her own, maybe with some of her friends. I'll go somewhere else where like-minded people want to watch their FA Cup final. I would so prefer to watch a royal wedding, not interested in football. Harry and Meghan solved the problem for TV viewers. They announced that their ceremony would begin at noon, several hours earlier than kickoff time. But Wills decided to avoid the fixture clash altogether. Next hurdle, the tricky protocol of who to invite to the royal wedding. Have you got an invite to the royal wedding? Have I? Yeah. Not that I know. Would you like to go? I want them to be happy. I really want them to be happy. They look like a lovely couple. Meghan Markle did say you were a divisive misogynist. Well, I still hope they're happy. It was a source of quite a lot of amusement for comedians in the US who like to take every opportunity they can to poke fun at him. So Donald Trump is mad because Prince Harry didn't invite him to the, to the wedding, to the royal wedding over there in England. I don't even know why. I don't know why you mad. You shouldn't even be surprised, uh, Donald. Don't nobody like you. The apparent decision to snub the US president may have been a source of jokes for comedians. But according to some sections of the media, it was also a potential embarrassment for the Queen. Could this dash all Meghan's good work? Especially in light of reports that the couple had invited Trump's predecessor, Barack Obama, a friend to them both. But as Harry and Meghan's wedding was a non-state event, that meant the couple could pretty much invite whoever they wanted. Now, this is not a state occasion, this wedding. He can invite his friends and Meghan's friends. He doesn't have to invite Trump. It's as simple as that. So the date was set, the invites were out, the corgis were brushed, and all was looking rosy for the big day and for Meghan to finally become Mrs Prince Harry. Until... Week lead up to the wedding was like watching an episode of EastEnders. It was an extraordinary week, completely overshadowed by the debacle over Mr. Markle. We were told that Thomas Markle would be walking his daughter down the aisle. In fact, a story that broke the weekend before in the Mail on Sunday undid all of that. Thomas Markle was revealed to have been staging fake pictures for the press to bolster his image pre wedding for the reported sum. $100,000. First of all, the pictures are leaked. Her dad is posing for pictures with paparazzi. Such was the embarrassment Mr. Markle felt he'd caused to his daughter that at the 11th hour, he pulled out of the wedding. It got so confusing. It was like, is he going to be coming to the wedding? Isn't he? Meghan, I was told, was utterly heartbroken. She said that she forgave him for the photographs and she wanted there to walk her down the aisle on the big day and he agreed that he would do it until all of a sudden his health isn't good and he can't come to the wedding dun, dun, dun. thomas markle said he felt that the heart attack had probably been brought about by his son to get out of this wedding and that his sister was nothing but trouble the whole of the country was talking about this what is going to happen and then finally we had a statement it was a coaster of emotions in fact prompted Meghan to issue her very first solo public statement and very tellingly that statement began with the word sadly must have been really difficult because in the end you know it was announced that her father wasn't becoming added to that parts of the family just descended on mass without an invitation Former sister-in-law Tracy Dooley, that's ex-wife of the half-brother who just trashed Meghan in a letter, jetted into Heathrow with sons Tyler and Thomas, plus a shed load of baggage in every sense. There's more likelihood that I would have got an invite. They turn up, got all the suitcases, you see them having their pictures taken in the airport, you're thinking, what is going on here? Because apparently they either think they're going to get a last minute, you know, somebody cancelled, you can come to the wedding now, or they're just going to make money off the British media and do loads of interviews. It's all about the... It'd be a pretty exclusive event. Right. Um, so, I mean, if, if they if they feel like they, they'd they like to invite us, we'd be honoured, and um, if not, we're going to be turning her on and... Yep. Totally um, supporting her, yeah, no matter we, what. And then, on top of all of this, Megan has to find out that her nephew, Tyler, is growing cannabis and has even called his special batch the Markle Sparkle. I mean... It was just disastrous from start to finish. And I think actually everyone, not just Meghan, was pleased when they packed their bags and went right back to where they came from. Cue an epic sigh of relief at the palace. 
Despite all these problems, the wedding stayed on track, which brings us nicely to step 11. Finally, on the 19th of May 2018, less than two years after Harry and Meghan's very first date in Soho House, the day we'd all been waiting for. The world tuned in for the fairy tale wedding of the century. Let's face it, if you're marrying a prince, you may as well pull out all the stops. Meghan and Harry really did have the ultimate fairy tale wedding. You know, they didn't choose St. Paul's Cathedral, where, of course, we saw Charles and Diana wed. We, they didn't choose Westminster Abbey like William and Kate. They chose Windsor, which is a lot smaller and feels a lot more private. I was there at the wedding on the day, and Windsor felt like literally a fairy tale come to life. Everything was magical. And the 600 guests drifted in, it was a veritable who's who of the world's A-listers, from music, film, and sport. I think this was the very first really modern royal wedding that we've ever seen, and it was Idris Elba, George Clooney and Amal, and a cast of suits. You had Hollywood stars mingling with British aristocracy. It was extraordinary to see. By the time HRH arrived, the atmosphere at Windsor was electric, with 200 representatives from the Prince's Charities among the 2,640 cheering onlookers. Meghan's bridesmaids and page boys included Princess Charlotte and Prince George, plus the children of some of her closest friends. Sporting the uniform of the Blues and Royals, the regiment Harry served in in the army, the groom arrived with a familiar-looking best man. Right on cue, Meghan arrived with Mum Doria in the Queen's Rolls-Royce Phantom Four. The wedding was phenomenal. The wedding was amazing. I mean, we all wanted to see what she was wearing. And we weren't disappointed. When Meghan stepped out in a Givenchy dress with a veil featuring flora and fauna from 53 Commonwealth countries. Topped off with her something borrowed from the Queen, Queen Mary's diamond bandeau tiara. But with an absent father, who would walk Meghan down the aisle? Prince Charles rises to the occasion. Prince Charles walks her down the aisle. It's amazing. Hashtag the power of love. Hashtag love survives. When you saw it on the day, it felt like the right thing to do. It was a wonderful way of Charles saying, welcome to the family. And actually of Meghan showing the world just how close she already is to her father-in-law. had successfully won over her in-laws. And here it was on display for all the world to see. It was lovely. It was really lovely. It felt positive. And, yeah, you couldn't help but smile watching it. When the night has come So, not only had Meghan married a prince, but she had ensured that their wedding would be one that British public would never forget. And neither would the 60 million who tuned in from around the globe. No, I won't. The courtiers to expect some surprises, but I don't think anyone expected quite what we saw. Listening to that incredible gospel choir, which was a beautiful touch and a wonderful nod to Meghan's dual heritage. Inside, you've got gospel choir, you know, raising the roof with the music. You've got the Reverend Michael Curry. I think without a doubt, Michael Curry was one of the stars, one of the unexpected stars of the day. I don't think anyone was expecting his sermon. I certainly don't think the royal family were expecting his sermon because the look of surprise and I might say amusement and bewilderment on some of their faces seemed to suggest that they were quite taken aback. We must discover the power of love. 
the redemptive power of love. And when we do that, we will make of this old world a new world. He started speaking. He just had everybody on the edge of their seats, whether you were there or you were watching it on the, on the television. The room felt alive. I don't think St George's Chapel has ever heard such an effusive um, address or heard Martin Luther King quoted in that way. There's power in love. Don't underestimate it. Don't even over-sentimentalize it. There's power, power in love. You know, there is power in love, and if we hadn't heard it once, it was drilled into us, so we knew that by the end of his sermon. Well, there's power, power in love. Her family weren't there. It was just her mother, but her story, her African-American heritage, that was all beautifully reflected in the ceremony and in the day itself. All these things that are really very Megan just made you realize how much more the world is coming together. It was poignant, powerful stuff. Megan, I give you this ring. Megan, I give you this ring. As a sign of our marriage. As a sign of our marriage. By the joining of hands and by the giving and receiving of rings. I therefore proclaim that they are husband and wife. She'd done it. She got the ring and she'd married her prince. Watching that wedding, you know, even if you're not a royalist and you, you're not a, a romantic, you really couldn't help but be taken in by it because it was two people that actually seemed like they were really in love, um, which on any level is, is just so nice to see. But the party was only just getting started. Serena Williams playing beer pong. I bet she aced it. <laughs> Meghan had gone from actress to duchess. And our penultimate tip, really for those who've gone and bagged their prints, is celebrate with the best ever party. Immediately after the wedding, the couple had all 600 guests back to St George's Hall for a wedding breakfast, which was hosted by Her Majesty the Queen. Um, but the real golden ticket to that event was the private evening party, which was hosted at Frogmore that evening by Prince Charles. We saw, of course, Meghan's dress for the after-after party, which was by Stella McCartney. She looked glamorous. Harry looked like James Bond walking out of the palace to get into their vintage Jaguar. This was a very modern, sexy, gorgeous couple. We saw the couple speed away in that beautiful blue E-type Jaguar. Meghan resplendent, it has to be said. Harry looking more James Bond than Prince Harry. Anyone who was anyone was there, sipping on their When Harry Met Meghan ginger and rum cocktails. George and Amal, Serena Williams, James Corden, and Idris Elba, who turned DJ for the night and span a few tunes. <laughs> I was put forward to DJ. I really wanted to DJ. I would have done the best wedding set in the world. <laughs> It must have been incredible. Everyone's probably a bit more relaxed, you know, a bit more loose, getting on the cocktails, having a chill. Everyone just wanted to know the juicy details of this VVIP party. Were these huge Hollywood stars and celebrities doing the same kind of things we do when we've been drinking since about midday? Yes, they were. <laughs> Some wonderful tales of Serena Williams beating everyone hands down at beer pong, a drinking game that apparently Meghan and Harry loved. Serena Williams playing beer pong. I bet she aced it. Serena has since denied she played this game. Shame. But who knows, maybe when they throw their next party. George Clooney serving up cocktails and whisking Meghan and Kate around the dance floor. 
William, Charles and Harry. Which we like to imagine looked like this. Come on, well, it's my I, reception. Good bust of you. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay. Yeah, come on. You like that, <laughs> brother? Yeah, twerk it, wheels. Just yeah. sham on. Twerk it, wheels. Uh, there you go. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Grandmom just saw that. Bollocks. All right. Uh. <laughs> Having an absolute laugh. I mean, was the Queen there? What was she doing? Was she, was she watching it? Was she getting involved? It just sounds like, you know, the doors have been closed, the curtains have been closed, and it's like, right, let's go for it. Let's have a laugh. Let's enjoy this. I think it was just a fantastic night where the couple were able to really do things their way, from serving dirty burgers at midnight out of posh burger stalls in the grounds of Frogmore to handing out monogrammed slippers so that their guests in those six-inch Louboutins or whatever they were wearing could actually rest their weary feet come the end of the night. And if you want to ensure you throw the best party ever, be like Megan. Make sure your guests leave their phones at the door so you can let your hair down without any sneaky snappers. You don't want a repeat of the dramas of a previous royal wedding. <laughs> Ten years earlier, the same venue had hosted the wedding reception of Harry's cousin, Peter Phillips, and his wife, Autumn Kelly, who provoked a scandal when, unbeknownst to most of the guests, they sold photos of the private bash to Hello! magazine for half a million pounds. Generally, what happens in the private news stays in the uh, private news. There are no cameras there, or none of our cameras. Are there. So what happened with Peter and Autumn's wedding is controversial and unusual. The junior roles are a wedding ceremony, which is where they're supposed to be the private situation, the most private roles are ever in, inside their own home, for goodness sake. And they thought this was just photographers at a wedding and happily posed and grinned away. And then we're quite amazed in a couple of weeks afterwards to see 59 pages of a Hello supplement dedicated entirely to that they thought were private family shots. I think it went down like a lead balloon with many members of the royal family. Luckily, Harry and Meghan's wedding reception went off without a hitch, but with a bang. One of my favorite details about the whole thing is that uh, Harry and Meghan snuck away at the after party. They went off to be together. And I think that speaks a lot about this couple. They are above everything else madly, genuinely in love with each other. Which leads us beautifully into the final step of our Bag of Prince guide. Live happily ever after. What will we see next? Um, I think we will see them both just dive into work. I think there's a feeling about the two of them that they don't want to hang around. They want to, they want to get involved with their charities. She seems to be a woman with a mission, and I don't think it'll be also are desperate to start a family. And I think it won't be too long before we hear the patter of tiny royal feet. I think that's definitely high up on the agenda. <laughs> So there you have it, from being born into showbiz, to getting famous, to moving countries, making moves in royal circles, charming the in-laws, and staying silent in the face of criticism. Meghan Markle might not have set out to bag a prince, but follow her lead, and maybe you could do it too. It was the ultimate American dream, because hers was a bit of a rags to riches story, and her journey from the leafy suburbs of LA to Toronto to Kensington Palace to St. George's Chapel has been a monumental, epic, and frankly, incredible story. It's so good nice to meet you. Meet you. She's a modern woman. This is how we all live, you know, from mixed race families, you know, interracial marriages, coming from different countries. That is what society is about now. The fact that she's unusual for the royal family, I think the fact that she comes from a different country, a different background, it's just a plus. She is very much a breath of fresh air. She's incredibly focused. She's incredibly driven. Women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice. They need to feel empowered to use it. And people need to be encouraged to listen. She's got the biggest platform. She's got huge ideas. And she is changing the game in a very cool way. And she makes Prince Harry happy, and so he now has that partner that he said he always wanted to share the load with. And in Meghan Markle, he found her. If this were a movie script, you would say that Meghan completes him.
matter of mere months of dating her, Harry had Meghan meet the Queen. She's an incredible woman. And the, and the corgis took to you straight away. <laughs> sure. In fact, Queenie was so impressed that mere weeks after the couple's engagement, she took the unprecedented move of inviting Meghan to spend Christmas in Norfolk at Sandringham, giving Meg the opportunity for a serious charm offensive. It was a tremendous break with convention that the Queen invited Meghan, who was, after all, just a fiance, to Sandringham, because normally it's just the wives and the husbands of members of the royal family who are allowed that. I was told that the Queen's feeling was this. She's preparing to give everything up for her grandson, her career, her identity, her nationality, her home in Toronto, everything to be with Harry. And the Queen's feeling was the very least we can do is to make her welcome at Christmas. It does show that the Queen is walking in step with the change of the guard at Buckingham Palace. This would have been a far different Christmas to the one Meghan spent in L.A. the previous year, with the historic 20,000-acre estate playing host to all sorts of... The hats who get ahead around quite a few uh, royal family traditions. They open their presents on Christmas Eve. The presents that they exchange aren't what you'd really expect for members of the royal family. They tend to share really jokey presents with one another. In America, you know, things will come beautifully wrapped and be quite extravagant. And this is the other end of the sphere. You're admired if you find somebody's given you an unusual spoon to stir cakes in or an unusual thing.